everything old is new again. America's entertainment pop culture talk show. It may well possess a rudimentary intelligence. I'm trying to think, but nothing happens. Well, the great disturbance in the force. Hello, I'm Mr. Ray. Come on, Mark, I got a job for me. Where's the goodies? Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. I bet you wouldn't have done anything like this if Mom and Dad were here. You filthy criminal. Excuse me while I whip this out. Go ahead. Make my day. Here are your hosts, Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. You know how to be the manager of the baseball team? Yes. You know the guys' names? Oh, I should. Well, you tell me the guys' names on the baseball I team. I say, who's on first? What's on second? I don't know who's on third. You ain't saying nothing to me yet. Go ahead and tell me. <laughs> I'm telling him. You said nothing yet. Go ahead and tell me. Who's on first? What's on second? I don't know. Is on third. You know the guy's I'll... names on the baseball team. Yes. Well, go ahead. Who's on first? Yes. I mean the guy's name. Who? The guy playing first. Who? The guy playing first base. Who? The guy on first base. <laughs> Who is on first? What are you asking me for? I don't know. Uh, welcome to Everything Old is New Again. We're back again talking about baseball. We're on a, a run this summer with baseball promoted and baseball themed shows literally we're the only ones by exactly the way. literally wanted fan at a time we we're going to bring baseball back on the map and uh, single-handedly make it america's favorite pastime all over again i'm here douglas viviani with the mlb rule nick himself <laughs> david cohen I'm a, I'm a Russian a Russian baseball spy. You're a rule maker. Igor Rulnik. <laughs> you are crazed with the rules. First of all, let's look at one thing at a time. The rules have been presented that there is a change this year and next year on the horizon for sure. Right. We have had rule changes. So, let's look at those first. Commercial breaks between innings are reduced by five seconds. Does that matter? I think it will. I think it will. Especially once you set a precedent with that, I can see that crunching down even to smaller increments. If you notice, one of the things that you're doing now so that they can get around that as far as commercials go, have you seen this thing where suddenly the, the screen shrinks and, right. you, and you're still watching the game, but you've got the little, uh, little sidebar going with uh, some cable company or something with a little voiceover that talks for about 15 seconds. That could be the wave of the future, so you don't have to go to actual commercial breaks as often. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. You know, there's, there's too many breaks in the action as it is when the game is being played. And let's be clear, David Cohen and Douglas Viviani love baseball and want baseball to be America's pastime. That's why we keep talking about it. Right. So we're not picking on it just to be a naysayer or right. whatever. Right. So, okay. Now, All-Star voting. I, something's happened to the All-Star game. I love the All-Star game. Used to love it much more. Now it's sort of you know, not really watched. So they're trying to do something, which I think is kind of cool. Yes, you're voting. fans are voting as always. You can vote online. You can vote at the stadium, whatever. But then, so that's one set, and those votes will be counted, and there'll be one batch there. The second batch is going to be where you have one day, election day, whatever that day is going to be, and everyone can vote only on that one day. So it, it, it raises the level of expectation or urgency to have to vote that day, if you're interested in doing so. Do you care? I think it's a good idea on paper, but... Think about how we have to be reminded just to what the voting date is for, for electing the president of the United States, right. let alone remembering that this is the day we get to vote on our baseball players. So I think, right. sadly, I think it's going to fail miserably, but it's a good thought. It's, Although it will, if, you're, if you're a fan, you're going to be hearing about it at, like for two weeks before the day. Yeah, every maybe. If, if, well, that's the thing. Baseball is horrible at promoting right. itself. If they right. can promote this, then it might work. Right. Okay. Now, at the All-Star Game, do you like the Home Run Derby? No. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of it because baseball's not about the home run exclusively. And, and I saw one in person. I was at Yankee Stadium one of the years, I think it was the final year at Yankee Stadium, where they had the home run derby. Yeah, it, it wasn't any better being there. <laughs> <laughs> Still, it's like, eh, And they're right. not going to give the winner a million dollars because they want, of course, the best home run hitters because you notice a lot of them bail out and don't. Do it as they years. should, right? I mean, I'd want to protect my players. I don't want them getting hurt in the home run derby. But right? if you're going to win a million dollars for winning the derby, you may now join it. Yeah, maybe, I maybe. Don't know. Uh, Max, but that doesn't, you know, in the long run. So what? 
Like, who cares? Right, even know. if even if it becomes a thing, right? That's one night. And right. What do, you, what do you do for the rest of the baseball season? Right. And no one really, you know, okay. So, uh, maximum mound visits per game is now six, will be down to five. It used to be unlimited a couple years ago. I think that's a great idea. I think it's helping immensely, and I think they should just keep going in that direction. Yes, yes. Uh, next year, a player will have to face at least... I guess we're going to say a pitcher, at least three batters before re- being removed. You can't go in there for just one batter. I think it's a great idea. You know, I years ago, you would have a lefty specialist, let's say, that would come in and face one batter. And I actually didn't mind that. That was that was when you were only bringing in maybe maybe two relievers at most during a game. So bringing the extra guy, I didn't mind so much. But now it's become a thing. Like you're only bringing in a reliever to face one batter and then okay next batter another guy next batter another pitcher next batter another pitcher so i i like i've come around to liking this idea based on how the game has changed right and a lot of the pitchers now are being changed in between innings right you know so that helps a lot and that this helps to reduce that pitching change during the inning as well i mean what is it going to come down to at some point are we going to have like some guy goes out there and pitches a strike, and then some other guy comes in and pitches the next pitch. It's like every pitch, you're going to have another guy. I think that's in. a bigger, bigger, bigger problem. <laughs> is that little league kids, kids in high school, kids in college, before they get to them in minor leagues, if they're not pitching the number of innings that Tom Seaver, let's just say, pitched when he was a young guy. Listen, kid, <laughs> you just come in here and just throw one pitch. That's it, and it, then you're out. It's horrible. one pitch. So their arm strength is way down. If you compare the arm strength of of however you could do this, of let's just say Tom Siva, Bob Gibson, whoever, and now Syndergaard and these guys, I guarantee you that the pitcher from the past, his arm strength is much, whether, whether it's more resilient, whether it's stronger, however you want to phrase it, that pitcher can pitch 200 innings without a season, without a problem. And guess what? A large majority of pitchers in the league pitched complete games right. and uh, you know 200 plus innings. Now, I think you may get one or two pitchers in the entire league that goes 200 innings. Right. And as a result, I think the problem is that these pitchers are too fragile because they've been made fragile from day one. Yeah. They're not pitching as much, and they're throwing, they're told to throw really hard. So, right. You know, and it's you not can, pitching. Because you can always get Tommy John surgery to, to correct whatever's ailing you. Right. But, P.S., that's not pitching, just throwing a fastball. I know. Well, it is these days, but yeah. I, I know. think we're going to have, it's going to come back at some point, you know, full circle, I think. How about some proposed changes do you have any that you're familiar with that you like don't like whatever i do i mean there's some that they're floating out there they might you know they might implement next year in and i think it's like the atlantic can i stop you for a minute yeah sure before we do the proposed yeah. what problem are we trying to solve here <laughs> well we're trying to do two things well the overall thing we're trying to do is make the game more fun to watch more interesting to watch and so under that umbrella they're trying to reduce, I think, the amount of time it takes to complete a baseball game. Right. I mean, sitting down and committing three hours to anything is is pretty pretty you know boring. Now, football could go three hours, and but again, there's other elements of football that you don't have in baseball, like like you're only playing once a week. So in baseball, I think it's a combination of a making the game shorter so people can fit it into their schedules, but also making the game more interesting to watch. Well, so if the game is shorter, things. it's going to be more interesting because the action is going to be more condensed. Condensed, right. Exactly. And if you go to YouTube, I know I've said this before, go to YouTube and watch a game from the 1960s. They're there, full games. They're an hour and 59. Right. You, you know, I'm not saying you sit and watch, but watch what they do. They don't do all the stuff they do now. But I think that's only part of the problem. Yes. You can condense it to two hours, but you you still may not get people to watch because it's still, quote-unquote, boring to watch. So th- they're, they're creating some elements to make the game itself more exciting. Okay, so let's see. And some of those, I think, are helpful. Um, for instance, I think one of the things they're they're doing possibly is putting a time clock on the pitcher, so that you have X number of seconds to throw a pitch, which will shorten the game for sure. Um, but I think, and it's I'm sure going to get a lot of resistance from the players' union and and from owners. But I think that the other element that they're adding is not just shortening the game, but just making each at bat more exciting because if a pitcher is on a clock. 
you're just going to see more pitches, right? And you're probably going to see more. If you're going to see more pitches. You're going to see more contact. You're going to see more balls in play. And I think that's what people like. It's gone are the days, Doug, of when you and I liked seeing, you know, uh, maybe two hits on one team, like a, like a, like a pitching duel, right? right. But there, there's no more pitching duels because you don't have a pitcher going more than four or five innings. Right. So it's hard to get that pitching duel thing. So what do you do instead? Get the action. Get the ball. Make contact. Get it out in the field, and let's see some action. Right. And I think it's something that is part of that rule is that the pitch, the batter, as you said, has to stay in the box. Exactly. Yeah, the pitch is coming in, in whatever it is, 45 seconds, regardless of whether you're ready as a batter, unless right. you're hurt or something. You have a, another quick one? Just got like y- Yeah, the, well, seconds. the other thing I'm not that thrilled about, but it might help, is they're thinking of moving the mound back a little bit. So, it's, so, so to give the, the batter, I guess, a more fair... Uh, chance of making contact with the ball because right now it's all about how hard can you pitch and as a batter how far can you hit the ball well the i i understand that concept but i think it's a horrible idea we've had it at one length for a hundred years and now all of a sudden the statistics that we had before the mound and after the mound are going to be uh, askew uh, the other side of the coin is that the players are fan. bigger they're faster and the game right. is changing so maybe the old dimensions just don't fit the, right. the, the athlete of today but yeah no it's in, there's arguments on both sides all right we'll be back right this everything all is new again continue talking all things baseball and uh, what's happening in this baseball world today This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Suppose you walk into a baseball field. Uh, What teams are playing? I don't know. Then what are you doing in that baseball field? I don't know. You got me in here and I'll get me out. Look, what is the first thing you buy in a baseball field? A hot dog. A hot dog. (laughs) Without mustard? Mm -hmm. Mustard goes with a hot dog. Not with mine. Mustard was made for the hot dog. Now, but I look, I don't like mustard. Mustard and the hot dog go together. Let them go together. I don't want to spoil any romance. Do you, do you know they spend millions of dollars every year to put up factories just to manufacture mustard? Do you know those factories employ thousands and thousands of men just to manufacture mustard? Do you know those men take care of thousands of families and homes all on account of mustard? And you, just because you don't like mustard... What do you want them to do? Close those factories down and put all those people out of work? Uh, welcome back to Everything Old is New Again. How could we have a show about baseball without a little uh, introduction to uh, you know a segment with Abbott Costello? What do you yeah, think? Yeah, no, come? absolutely. All right, so there's a little bit about the hot dogs. And the reason I bring that up a little bit is I want to, rather than we've been talking about you know predictions and what teams we feel are going to do well this year and so forth, I want to talk about the experience of baseball itself at the ballpark. And, of course, a hot dog is, is certainly part of that. So is keeping score, maybe. So is actually understanding and watching the game as opposed to shopping at the stores, various outlets, and eating the various foods. Or just kind of staring at your phone and getting other scores while you're actually at a game. <laughs> exactly. So we've had some rule changes. We've had some complaints in the past. Uh, we've gone through that with our show 224, our panacea for baseball. If anybody wants to take a look and listen to that, go ahead look at uh, everything old is new again. Dot biz. Look for show two twenty four or our YouTube uh, section. You can look at that. I have a channel. But we have a guest that is coming on board here for this section. A friend of David Cohen. David, you want to introduce? Yeah, him? sure. Uh, we have Billy Edelman on the phone. Say hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hey guys, how you doing? <laughs> Good. Welcome. So, just so the audience knows, uh, Billy and I go back a long, long time, and he's an avid sports fan, especially a big baseball fan. He's an encyclopedia of knowledge, and uh, I thought it would be great to have have him on the show to give us some of his, his thoughts on, on the state of the game and what's good and what's bad. And one thing I just wanted to start with, because in our last show we spoke about keeping score, and you mentioned a gentleman that kept score and really gets a, a thrill, if you will, and, and enjoys the game for that, and this is the gentleman, our scorekeeper himself. Our scorekeeper, Billy, yeah. You're still doing that, Billy, right? I've, actually, I've transferred it now to my daughter, where she actually keeps score. Oh, I love it. So I can actually now get up and go get something to eat. I'm not stuck to my seat anymore like I was for, you know, 45 years. So you can, <laughs> you can supervise and be the uh, statistician, if you will, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, what, what is about, now here, that's a lost art to me. Now, when we walk into the ballpark, I'm not so aware of it. Um, do you see people selling scorecards anymore, Bill? Oh, they still sell it as soon as you walk in. Okay. Um, but you don't see as many people... Now, let me ask you a question. If, if you were able to, or the next generation of pe- people were able to, go on an app at the ballpark 
and keep score on their phone just to make it more, you know, uh, millennial, if you will, friendly, uh, as opposed to writing it, God forbid, with a pencil and a, and a piece of paper. Do you think that that would be something that would uh, maybe let's talk about your daughters then? I don't know. Let, would that be something that would uh, interest them or not? Uh, I think the hardcore fan would do it. You know, I think a casual fan is not going to do it anyway. Okay, so right. even if it's an app on the phone and what have you, it's. Right. Uh, I, I don't think, I don't think a casual fan cares enough. You know, they just go to get the all-around experience at a game. Okay, where someone that's keeping score, I mean, they're really into it. Keep not that you have to keep. You know, if you're not keeping score, you're not into it. I don't mean it that way, but it's just like I was at David Wells' perfect game. I have the scorecard from that. Right. You know, it's something that. Every time you go to a game, you don't know what you're going to see. Right. In every game, you see something different. Now, let's talk about that. Because baseball has changed. There are some different things going on. Uh, you know, time frame, the rules, uh, they've, they've kind of changed a little bit. They're cutting off five seconds in between the local games, 25 seconds off the national games. There's one fewer mound visit permitted. There's only five mound visits permitted a game now. And next year, any pitcher entering the game must face at least three batters. Uh, and I'm a purist. I don't really like all extra rules. I don't have a major objection to any of these. What are your thoughts on these, just to start? I don't, I don't like that the pitcher has to face three batters. I don't have a problem. I have more of a problem that a starter only goes four to five innings now, and then you're into the bullpen in the fifth inning. Right. That, that's more of an issue than having a, uh, a reliever only come in to face the left. Well, but let me ask you a question. Are you keeping score? Um, you're looking at your scorecard, you're looking around the ballpark, and you're waiting and you're waiting for the song to end when so-and-so gets up to bat. You're waiting for the applause sign to, to die down and tell the crowd to stop clapping. You're waiting for the pitcher to fix his uh, pants. You're waiting for the batter to fix his uh, bat in the pine tar, and then he's waiting for him to fix his helmet. Then you're waiting for him to get that you know, other foot into the batter's box. I mean, just describing it alone, I could go on with more things of these idiosyncrasies these guys have is that not annoying to you uh, do you feel as a real fan that that's something that's taking away from the game or do you not mind sitting around waiting for these characters as a real fan I don't mind it what I think I mean it'll never change because there's too much money involved you talk about in between innings the old days like if you watch a highlight of like the 56 World Series so the in between innings I got eight pitches eight warm ups and there you go. Yeah, but Bill, what about in between pitches? Hey, right. Take a look at that same game. You're going to see about maybe, maybe 10 seconds between pitches. Now you're seeing about 30 between pitches. Am I wrong? Sometimes you're absolutely right. And that, that is to me. That's just... what I tell Doug all the time. Sometimes <laughs> he's absolutely right. That actually sounds pretty good. But it's, it's a con, it's, it's kind of works, but it, I don't know. It's a backhanded, right, comment? Yeah. Uh, but do you get what I'm saying? Like, to my daughter, who's 10, she's not waiting 10, I mean, 30 seconds for a pitch or in between pitches to get involved and enjoy this game. It's too slow for her. And I don't blame her. I used to watch games two hours and 10 minutes and kill a brood be up and, and hit and he'd stand in the, the you know, the battle his box and he'd stand there through his his uh, at bats unless he b- fouled something off or broke his bat or whatever what are we doing with all this nonsense but in between I, pitches i'll give you that but when a, there's a runner on base and the pitcher is in a stretch and if he if the runner knows that he's got to go in five sec you know he's got a pitch in five seconds i mean where do you draw the line of how much time in between now right now it doesn't matter with a man on but you could keep taking it. Well, you know, it takes too long. You know, there, there's a reason there's no clock in baseball. You know, yeah, yeah, but there's also a reason why the attendance is going down and the, the viewing of the viewership is going down and the ratings going down. It's been set up becoming a national game. It's a regional game now. Well, the World Series, no one's watching was, the World Series anymore if your team is not in it. Just but saying. I think it always was a regional game anyway where you could go to minor league parks. Well, let me let me, but, out, but, you know. yeah, but let me disagree only because I want to get you going here, Bill. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get you riled up uh, because I spoke to a guy the other day from from Minnesota. I spoke to him about how we're going to have a guest on the show, Ron Swoboda, in the future, 1969 ball player. He knew who he was because at 69 he was about our age uh, right. in Minnesota. 
they took the game or TV set into his school and watched the Mets versus Baltimore in Minnesota. So I, I don't know that it was n- not national then. But you also, it was an afternoon game. Correct. You want kids to, to follow. Don't start games at 8.30 at night. You're abs- and then the Yankees uh, have just changed it, doing a bunch of them at 6.30, if you notice, right? Right. Which but, is a I terrific mean, idea. I mean, I, at this point, if teams that I don't care about are in the World Series. I don't watch a whole game because I have to get up to go to work. But if the game starts, even on a weekend, it used to be in the 70s they started with the night games. And then it wasn't until the 80s that every game became a night. But you can remember Saturday and Sunday, there was still afternoon World Series games, so kids could watch it. I agree but if you're starting at 8.30 at night, I mean... And you're getting up at 6 in the morning to go to work or to go to school. Who's staying up till 12.30 to watch the game? The, the game the, this past year, with the, what was it, 18-inning game, I woke up in the middle of the night and put it back on and saw the end. Right. You know, was, and, of course, you're, you, Bill, your, your daughters don't stay up either to watch these games, no. right? I mean, if it was a Yankee World Series game, yeah, of course they would. But to see you know, the, the Red Sox and the Dodgers or the Astros and the Dodgers, no, they're not going to watch it. Right. I agree with you 100% on Russian because right. a little bit of time. I, I agree with you 100%. I think there should be that, remember that game of the week on Saturday afternoon? I know it's not as special because we get any game we want, but still, if you've got national announcers on a national game that's not regional, that's on throughout the country, that your team is on for that Saturday, I just, you know, we're hearing, you know, I'm going back, go Joe Garagiola or right. you know, whoever might yeah. be the, the, the great of announcers course, yeah. of the day, announce your team. That's special. That's Absolutely. different. It, it was a big deal. And yeah. a lot of it is because it's on every day now, it doesn't, you, it's diluted where it doesn't have the meaning that it used to. But I agree. When the Yankees were on the game of the week, even though it may have been blacked out locally, it was still a big deal. And know? so it was it like, was, you know, the Dodgers against, uh, you know, the Cubs or whatever. It right. seems you didn't really focus on, but you heard these announcers that exactly. you, you loved or, you know, as national announcers, it gave you some ambiance, you know? So, uh, Bill, listen, I hate to say this. We're already out of, uh, out right, of time. Right. We could do another segment for sure. Uh, but let's go out for now. We'll be right back right at this. And everything old is new again. Meet the Mets. Meet the Mets. Hey, Doug, it seems like we've done so many shows. What is the actual count? We're at 214 and counting, increasing every week. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. All right, so let's say that I'm a listener, I'm a fan of the show, and I've missed the last 213 shows, (laughs) right? Where can I go to to hear this stuff? Uh, It's a great question. We have a channel on YouTube. So just go to Everything Old is New Again Radio. Look that up on YouTube. Just throw it into the search engine. You will see us come up and you will see all of those shows listed on YouTube. You can listen anytime. Now, what if I wanted to find you somewhere else, like well, on Facebook? Yeah, we're, we're on, on Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, absolutely. Facebook also. Just go Everything Old is New Again in the search. You will find us. And we post shows all the time. In fact, every Friday at 5, Eastern Standard Time, we post an old show so you can listen to it on the way home from work. Wow. That's cool. That's new, right? It sure is. Uh, I would suggest you do that. Everything old is new again. Enjoy. And you can find us on the web at everythingoldisnewagain.biz. You're listening to Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. On the corner of the national pastime went on trial. We're talking baseball. Klazuski, Campanella, talking baseball. All right, we're back here on Everything Old is New Again. Continue our discussion of baseball, and I'll tell you, we had a nice discussion there with, with Billy. We'll be back with him in the fourth segment of our show. We're in the third right now, but we have a special guest. We've got a call in here to the vice president. I'm sorry, not the commissioner of the Atlantic Pacific League, Charles Granger, and I'll explain this uh, in a moment, or maybe he'll explain it to us better. Uh, Mr. Granger, are you on the phone first? I'm here, Doug. Yeah, and you can call me Charlie. All right, Charlie. Great to hear from you. The Atlantic Pacific League is something that, what happens? The the initial type of experimentation on rule changes are implemented in your league? Is that what's happening? Yeah, that's actually well said, Doug. Uh, down here at the Atlantic Pacific League, 
Uh, we like to think of it as like a think tank for rule changes that ultimately will be uh, implemented, we hope, by Major League Baseball. Okay, that's pretty much what I just said, but all right, I'll go with that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Granger, do you have any, or Charlie, do you have any ch- rule changes that you can tell us that's upcoming for the you know this year or maybe next year? What, what can we look forward to? Well, we, we're actually working on a pretty radical one right now that's uh, had some success down here, uh, and we're hoping eventually we'll make its way back up to the major leagues. Uh, there's been some talk about reducing the amount of time that a pitcher has to throw to throw pitches. I'm sure you've heard of that rule, right? Yeah, I sure have. So what we're doing in the Atlantic Pacific League is we're taking that rule and we're condensing the time that a pitcher has to throw a pitch. So once the pitch is caught by the catcher, the pitcher has five seconds to throw another pitch. It's a radical idea, but so far it's been working pretty well, and we think that's going to really speed up the game. Well, what happens if he doesn't throw the pitch in the five seconds? Well, so far, every pitcher's been doing it within five seconds, and I'll tell you why. We don't have to worry about exceeding the five seconds. What we did is we've got this whole garbage can of baseballs sitting right out at the mound. (laughs) So you remember maybe Doug as a kid, you know, just having a bunch of baseballs and sort of wailing them at a friend of yours holding a bat. Right. And they can't, they'd have trouble, like, keeping up with swinging at all the balls, you're wailing at them. Well, that's kind of the idea that we've got here at the Atlantic Pacific League. So a pitcher can just reach right into the bat right next to him and just keep balling them in. Well, I mean, uh, how does a catcher catch the ball, get it back to the pitcher, and the pitcher throw in five seconds? Catching well, the ball. That's, that's the beauty of it. The catcher doesn't have to throw the ball back to the pitcher. He just has to catch it. Well, what does he, he do just, with it? Like, rolls it off to the side, yeah. Throws it off to the side to where? Then you have a bunch of balls on the field? Yeah, so it keeps the ball boys employed. I tell you that, Doug. They've got a big job of, you know, rounding up those balls that the catcher just sort of trickles off to the right, you know, and that that sort of – it's fun for the fans to watch the ball boy try to wrangle all them balls. Yeah. Oh, it's a funny thing. <laughs> Sounds like a silly idea. Huh? Hey, you have any other ones? We have, what, what else you have? Well, you know, another thing we're experimenting with – and by the way, it, it, it does sound – I know it sounds a little silly, but in practical terms – uh, it really keeps batters on their toes, and the only thing we're dealing with is, uh, as you can imagine, as a pitcher throws so many pitchers and do- doesn't have a lot of time to do it, uh, he can be kind of wild. So a lot of the batters are getting plunk, and uh, it's I can imagine I can I can imagine bats, the ball boys in the back there are not getting the ball in in five seconds time. To, they'll they'll probably be in play half the time. Yeah, well, there could be a lot of them in play, and that act adds to the excitement of the game. <laughs> uh, but but another thing we're we're trying, you know, with all these home runs being hit, right? Uh, with you know, uh, baseball metrics and uh, being what they are right now, and batters being instructed just to hit home runs. One of the things we're experimenting with is adding some outfielders. Uh, we're, we call them the out outfielders because Doug, they're actually in the stand. So we've got an outfielder. You know, buying a seat in the left field stand and another one in the right field stand. So when the ball home run is hit, they the other team's got an extra player to try to catch that ball and, oh. and get the and get the batter out. So the the extra two players have to buy their own seats, though. Yeah, you know that's it's a, it kind of causes a little bit of a scheduling mess uh, so far because the team's responsible in advance for buying a seat in left field and right field for their outfielders. And if they don't do it, then, then obviously there's no room for the fielder to, to sit out there. So this this player, uh, so to speak, is sitting in the stands having a beer and a hot dog, but if there is a, a fly ball that comes their way that would otherwise be a home run, if they catch it, it's not a home run, it's an out. Is that what you're saying? That's right. It's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sound like there's going to well, be a- there, and there's there's another thing we're trying too that might be of interest uh, to you as well. Uh, it's called now. You, I, I heard a show you guys are doing uh, about you were lamenting the loss of the the old Saturday afternoon games. Right? You used to have a game of the week that you could watch out of town teams playing. Right? Actually, the Nash the the thing we're missing out is the national game of the week. Correct? Yes. Right. So so. They're not televising afternoon games so much anymore. So we, we came up with a solution to that in the Atlantic Pacific Lake. And what's happening is every Saturday afternoon, and, and all the games are played Saturday afternoons, 
every Saturday afternoon, each team must allow a fan to play three innings, usually in the outfield, and have at least one at-bat for their team. So it's like a fan participation thing. And i got to tell you, some of that stuff is real funny. When you see a ball hit to, to a person in, in left field who's just never played baseball before, it's funny to watch, and the fans are into it, and uh, the local TV ratings are going through the roof. <laughs> now, is, are there any age limitations on that at all? Well, there weren't, but we're realizing we have to, because we put a baby out there in right field, and that did not work <laughs> no, well at all. No. <laughs> what about yeah, either that or an older person may not have you know be able to get around and maybe a, a tough time everybody you know if you're a player that you could place the ball uh you're gonna place it in that person's direction and then what is not never going to be an end in, end in sight to the inning well you got to be lucky you know you can have a, a grandma out there in right field but you know you could also have like a like a really good fan you know like some like 20 year old a guy or gal who's, who's pretty good at the game, you can luck out and they can actually help your team. Well, how do you how do you select who's going to be the person, the fan? Well, you just have to announce the seat uh, the seat number before the game is randomly selected. So okay. you'll hear an announcement before the game, like if you're sitting in you know section seven, row five, seat B, come on down, get a uniform. <laughs> you're playing right field. <laughs> I would actually like that. Uh, if it was me, but I'm not so sure that fan participation. I mean, let's just think about the insurance problem uh, uh, unto itself. You can have a big insurance policy in cases of injury, or what goes on there? Well, yeah, um, actually, uh, we're, we're running into some financial problems right now because we've had a <laughs> few incidents, if, yeah. my, if you will, uh, out there with some of the, the fan players, and uh, we're actually in the process of settling a few lawsuits. But <laughs> hey, you know, uh, it's all for making the, the game better and. You know, that might work, it might not, and might put us out of business by next Tuesday at the court hearing, but who knows? We're trying. I'd like to know who the attorney was. I should have picked that case up myself. Listen, you have any others? We've got about two minutes left. Oh, yeah, yeah. we got some. We, we got some others that are really, uh, I think, working. So, you know the mail visit limitations? Sure. So we got those, but we added a, a, a tweak to it also. So the only, only person that can go out and visit the mound during any game is the team mascot, <laughs> right? So just just think about, like, if you're at a Philly, Philadelphia Phillies game and your pitcher's in trouble, you got to send the Philly fanatic out there to talk to your pitcher. And, and it's so funny because, like, if you want to bring in a reliever or something, can you imagine the fanatic, like, motion into the bullpen and, and you know, roll, falling down and, and, the, and the guys in the bullpen, they don't know who, which one's being selected to come in. It's hilarious. I can so, imagine. I, mean, I think I can, that's one of the more popular fan favorites right now. Also, many of the time that you want to bring a you know pitching coach or somebody in the manager to come in to calm the the pitcher down and you know kind of get them back on track. And with the Philly fanatic or the you know who missed the Met, I, 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 something tells me that the pitcher is not going to be too relieved to see uh, that person. No, you're right. They, they, these guys they get them riled up, you know, because sometimes the mascot will go and they'll start like kicking the pitcher, you know, or like, or like bringing like a fake like club out there with him and like bopping him over the right. head, you know. Right. I've hey, seen the, you know, the fake. Better. We're taking you out, buddy. Right. We've, we've seen the pie in the face sometimes with these, uh, these mascots, right? That, that's not going to work over too well with these players. But, well, you know, sometimes it does. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it just motivates the pitcher to just, just throw better because <laughs> he's worried about the. The mascot coming out and just embarrassing him, out, pulling his pants <laughs> down, something like that. It could be like psychologically, like a real motivator. So, well, you know, we're hoping that uh, eventually gets implemented by Major League Baseball. Listen, Charlie Granger, I appreciate your time for the Atlantic Pacific League. You're the commissioner of that league. I don't know for how much longer you will be the commissioner, but for however long it lasts, we're interested in your ideas. Maybe you can call us back another time. It sounds like you have a lot more ideas going, huh? Oh, yeah, we got a whole laundry list of them. And, uh, you know, like I said, as long as the lawsuits don't keep piling up, we should be uh, continue to be like a little micro lab and, and hopefully make the game more fun. But, Doug, uh, I appreciate your time and uh, hope, to, hope to speak with you guys again real soon. All right, we'll be here on Everything Old is New again, talking all things baseball this week. All right. Come on back. Oh, that's loud. Wow. Thank you, Charlie Granger. This is Everything Old is New Again, America's entertainment pop culture talk show. 
with Douglas Viviani and David Cohen. Well, that's baseball, and it's my game. You know, you take your worries to the park and you leave them there. You yell like crazy for your guys. Good for your lungs. Gives you a lift and nobody calls the cops. Pretty girls, lots of them. And a hot dog at the game beats roast beef at the Ritz. Uh, how could you not want to go to a ball game right now listening to that man, Humphrey Bogart, David Cohen? I just want to say pretty girls and good-looking guys, just to just to make it more modern. <laughs> All right? Lots of not nice, exclusive like that, okay? Fun, exciting people. And we're with a fun and exciting person, Bill Edelman, who is a baseball aficionado. And we're going to try to peel the onion here and see if we can solve some of the issues with baseball. Uh, Bill, can you... Can you define for us one of your major pet peeves with respect to baseball today and if you've got any thoughts as to how to resolve that? One of my big pet peeves is I don't think they play baseball anymore. I think it's more rotisserie where you look at stats and even though analytics is very important, you have to, it's people that are playing the game. If there's a shift, instead of breaking the shift and whether if you're a left-handed batter, just lay down a bunt down the third baseline, you get a double. You know, things like that would would end the shift very easily. But they don't do that. They know that, I guess, money involved. Nobody's paying money to a, a slap hitter. You're going to get big bucks if you're a home run hitter. You're right, and, but, and most, of the status, most of the stats will tell you that you got to swing up and hit a home run because that's the most efficient way to score runs and win games. Right, but, so they, they try to hit the ball over the shift. Right, but I would take a, a like a Billy Martin managed team. If you take Billy Martin with the A's in '81, and he would run those teams into the ground. If you look at the Red Sox last year, and you look at Houston, they had power hitters, but they they go from first to third on a base hit. They they would they would run the Yankees into the ground. I mean, they took advantage of weaknesses behind the plate. Well, but, if you were to take a look at the Dodgers of last year, and I know they did well. But they didn't win at all. But if you look, their power hitters hit 25 homers, a number of them, 25 homers, and their RBIs are 60 or 70 RBIs. That tells me there's nobody on base when they're hitting these home runs. Right. And their power hitters are striking out 100 times or more. And I, mean, I don't mean to say just the Dodgers, but if you look right. at Smith & Street or if you look at the stats, I, I just had recently spoken, reviewed that, that team. It just comes to mind. But I'm sure plenty, if not most teams, have that stat. And that's odd to me to hit 30 homers and have 70 RBIs, right? But you look at the Yankees. How many runners on base do they leave a the game? They'll club you to death. If you have a mediocre pitcher, they'll win 10-1. But when you face a good pitcher... They lose those three one three two games. Right now, you know, it, have you heard recently? I've heard, and it's really early in the season, that the Mets, just as an example, uh, have. And I've seen Cano do this a couple of times already. Have been beating the the shift by doing exactly what we're saying is going the opposite field. And they allegedly, uh, that's at least what the announcers are saying, that they are uh, been teaching that in the off season and the spring training to that team, that that's pretty much what you said, is, is the cure-all for that. Have you seen that, noticed that, or in, in, around the league, or well, what do you I say? I saw opening day at Yankee Stadium where in the, top, the bottom of the first inning, uh, Judge got up, he went to right center. They had the shift on Judge. Stanton got up, the shift was on him, he went to right center. Then Voight hit the home run. Now you got a three-run homer. But if Judge and Stanton are pull happy, which they become, then they're back to pull happy. Well, That's here's the when, thing too, though. Like, wouldn't like you mentioned Billy Martin and managers like that? Let's just look at this for a moment. Yeah, I I agree with you that a manager could or should have an influence on the method of hitting of their batters. In other words, are we going to hit and run, which you don't even hear about anymore? Are you going to bunt? Are you going to go the other way, and so forth? Um, but the question I have is, especially when you see Girardi getting fired and many managers getting fired, and the ones that are being hired are more or less neophytes to the to the managing game or a little bit weaker personalities because the, the, the front office, in essence, wants to give a game plan to the manager before they even start the game. And the game plan is not to tell their $10, 20000000 million player not to swing for the fences. So has the manager's influence... In, on a team and the method and the way that they play uh, been, been, what would you say, diminished by the, the front office these days? In, in many organizations, yes. Now, you look at the Red Sox with Alex Cora, and they play an aggressive game. 
where the Yankees don't. I mean, the Yankees are relying on that home run where the Red Sox get the home runs, but they're not relying on them. They, right. they manufacture runs. Now, does that come from the manager, or does it come from the front office, I or does it, it depend? From the, I think it comes from the front office. I agree. Now, because sure. I remember you'd see teams, you'd know a Billy Martin team, as you mentioned. He, they would pitch the, he'd pitch his pitches to the, right. you know, to the ninth it, inning. It, <laughs> and and they run, had no arms in a couple of years. <laughs> right, right. except for that, that, that A's team. But, and, and also, you know, uh, they would run and hit and run and so forth and be feisty. You would also know, you know, a, a Weaver team. You would know, you know, there are certain teams, managers, you would know their style. Right. I don't know in baseball that you have either that and, or let's develop it a little bit bigger, personalities or players allowed to have personalities in the game anymore, like a Mark Fidrich and players like that. You tell me. Well, if you look at baseball traditionally, they don't promote their stars. I mean, look at uh, Mike Trout, and nobody knows about him. You know, he's possibly the best player in the game, but he's he's, he's in L.A., and yet nobody knows about him. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, traditionally, they don't promote their stars as they should. Right, and, and the only reason I think Aaron Judge on the Yankees is promoted is because the Yankees promote him. They've got right. the they've got the uh, you know the the box in right the field where they chamber. put wigs. Yeah, the okay. judge, right, and that that story or what the Yankees did specifically became a national thing because of the Yankees promoting him. And he's in New York, which right. but you would think L.A. Even though he's not a Dodger, he's still in L.A., but he's not getting the promotion. Where Judge as a rookie. <laughs> You know, he was on uh, the Tonight Show. You know, that, right. and things like that. Where, but there are stars. But traditionally, baseball doesn't promote stars. If you take the NBA, I don't know if people are fans of teams anymore. They follow stars. You know, you, you can't go. The Nick game is still sold out, and they're pathetic. <laughs> but right, right. People come in to see the visiting stars. Where baseball, which we may have talked earlier, you don't get that. You know, you're, you're, it is regional, where nobody's going to pay to see Mike Trout. Nobody's going to pay to see Bryce Harper, you know, other than those fans of the Phillies or the Angels. You know, it, it's, they, I think baseball does a terrible job in marketing. So, Billy, what is it? So your, your daughters are really into baseball. They're keeping score, like we mentioned in the last segment, which is, like, unheard of these days. What is it? Do you, what do you think it'll take baseball to do to to continue to reach the the younger generation, which it's not doing right now, with with your daughters being the exception? I think they have to do a better job of promoting stars and having those kids. You look at again. I'm comparing to basketball, and I'm not a basketball fan, but you see kids, in, you know, in the schools all wearing jerseys of not no Nick jerseys. They're wearing all these visitors' jerseys. Where baseball, you don't see kids wearing jerseys other than you go to a Yankee game and you see all Yankee jerseys, but you're not seeing kids in school wearing a, a Bryce Harper jersey or, you know, name, name your player. You know, I'm just I mean, using I some, because of the contract that he signed. But. Right, but to some of that to me is you've got to stop thinking small that this is a regional game and a World Series playoff or game of the week is only should only be regional. That's To me, you've limited your audience right at the bat. You've told the audience just worry about your team. Don't worry about any other teams. I got news for you. When I grew up in the 60s and 70s, maybe it was a different world and I know it was. I knew... Five, six players per team, a little less number of teams, but still, per team, because I would watch, like we talked about, the right. national game of the week. Maybe the All-Star game had a little sense to it. You'd read the news, but you want, hey, that, maybe just the name of Hall and Killebrew, whatever, but you were interested in more teams than just your own. Of course you care about your own, but right. you want to see who the heck are they up against, you know? I, I was telling somebody a story about the World Series, even. I was an American League fan, so it didn't matter who was in the American League. When I was very young... It was one of the dark era, dark ages for the Yankees. I mean, they never sniffed the postseason when I was young, when I first started watching baseball. But the Orioles were in three years. I was rooting for the Orioles. The A's right. were in. I'm rooting for the A's. That's my league. And yeah. you knew players on the team without having to, you know, turn the TV on. Also, right. you know, had Absolutely. some. Absolutely. 
I mean, now I, I need a scorecard to go to a Yankee game, even if I wasn't keeping score. Well, that's you know that is another thing too. If you think about it, every year now I've got to pick up pick up the uh, this, this Smith and Street or the Street and Smith magazine and really study to figure out who's on what team because they've changed so often with the free agency and so forth. Although that that may be changing with these long term contracts for a couple of players, we'll see. Anyway, Billy, last thoughts. We've got thirty seconds. Is baseball going to come back and become America's uh, national pastime or no? I, I don't think it will at this point. I hate to say it because I love the game, and I, to me there's nothing like going and spending a few hours at a ball game on a nice day, but I'm a dying breed. <laughs> Let, let's hope, I, you might be right, let's hope you're wrong. Let's hope baseball listens to everything old is new again and our suggestions here. Billy, thank you. Thanks for joining us. And, thank you. Uh, we, we look, hope, hope you'll uh, come back in the future. Thank you very much. All right, we'll be back next week. Talk all things of entertainment, pop culture, on everything old is new again.